அப்புறம் 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 Can I have your attention, please? I think uh, we are ready for our next uh, keynote address uh, tonight. And um, I hope you enjoy the day, uh, the day, students and tutors. And uh, we're gonna close with a wonderful presentation by Professor Luzan, uh, an expert on asset pricing and uh, a subject that uh, is of his favorite investment campaign, and he's going to give us an update on his uh, latest research. Please welcome uh, Professor Luzan. Right. Thank you for having me. All right. I'm going to talk about uh, what I. I've been calling the investment CAPM and uh, some of its uh, latest uh, work. Um, so I've been arguing uh, in recent years that you can derive a new class of capital asset pricing models, uh, not from the standard uh, consumption oil equation, but from the standard investment oil equation. So what I call the supply theory of asset pricing. A new class of uh, capital asset pricing models arises from the first principle of real investment for individual firms. So in a sense, it's a corporate finance-based uh, framework for asset pricing. So let's start with the simple two-period model. Uh, it is general equilibrium, but it's only two-period. And um, um, I'm going to start with really simple framework in the sense that this is the uh, this is the theoretical framework that most of us have seen or mo most of us saw in first year uh, uh, PhD coursework. Three defining characteristics, um, rational expectations. Um, I'm only using this assumption as a benchmark, okay? Um, 
um, within the model, and the consumers maximize utility, firms maximize the market value of equity, or standard assumptions, and market's clear. Um, in, in, the, in the consumption side, and I'm gonna assume there exists a representative uh, agent, as in Cochrane's textbook, for example, um, maximize two period utility, uh, utility this, this period and the utility next period, and you've got the um, um, period T budget constraint, consumption plus savings, so price is price per share as is number of shares you carry to the next period, and on the right hand side that's your uh, financial wealth and the number of shares uh, you have at the beginning of today and uh, price per share and dividend per share. So you start with your financial wealth and then you consume and then you save or you invest in the, um, in the stock market and next period and you consume all your financial wealth and we have a big party and then we all go. So the world lasts for two periods. Um, from the first principle of consumption or consumption oil equation and we know from the standard asset pricing theory that you get the uh, consumption cap M or pricing kernel, the stochastic discount factor, the conditional expectation of pricing kernel times stock return equals one. Or you can rewrite using um, beta, uh, beta pricing form um, going back to Rubinstein 76 and then risk premium is proportional uh, to consumption beta. Okay, this is all well known. It's in all kinds of textbooks in uh, PhD level asset pricing. So I'm gonna talk about the supply side, individual firm side. Again, only in two period. The next, the next, uh, the, the left hand side is uh, X dividend price plus dividends. So the right hand side, the, the left hand side is basically cum dividend market value of equity. So the firm chooses investment. Again, the model is stripped down to the backbone. You can complicate things with financing policy, uh, payout policy, and um, the literature has not developed to that stage yet, but uh, we're just gonna stick with the um, uh, simplest form and to get the big picture, uh, big, uh, big ideas fixed first. So uh, you have productive assets, K, at the beginning of time, T, and the pi is profitability or return on assets. Pi times K would be your cash flow. And you get the uh, cash flow or operating profits, uh, you invest, capex, capital expenditure, you pay some frictions, uh, adjustment costs when you invest, and that's the first three terms gonna give you free cash flow, or dividends. So the model is simplest possible, and um, uh, we assume that firms just gonna pay the free cash flow back to shareholders as dividends or as payout. Um, and then on the, on the, on the, on the next period, and uh, you have uh, next period capital, and you produce uh, big cash flow again, you distribute everything back to shareholders, and we have a big party, and then we all go. Um, um, so, and, uh, and this is a two period setup, and from this you can write down the first principle of investment, so uh, you can also organize it in a, in, a, in, a, in a stochastic discount factor form, although later on I'm gonna abstract pricing kernel completely away. Uh, it's biometrically departure from uh, mainstream asset pricing. Uh, so uh, conditional expectation of pricing kernel times what Cochrane 91 calls the investment return, okay? And, um, um, and this is the investment oil equation that in corporate finance, uh, this equation, the dynamic version of this equation has been tested many, many, many times, oftentimes with uh, financial constraints. And the building on the inside first appeared in Cochrane, uh, 91 Journal Finance paper, you can rewrite a stock return. Uh, this is definition of return, next period price, dividends, current period price. And you can rewrite, you can prove uh, using a later on uh, insight from um, uh, Resto and Rockinger 94, also at Journal Finance, and turns out you can write stock return completely as a function of characteristics. And it turns out to be a um, powerful framework uh, for the anomalous literature that I've been um, working in uh, since grad school. So, so stock return equals, in the numerator, is profitability, um, or K 
cash flow divided by productive assets in the denominator is marginal cost of investment. I'm assuming quadratic adjustment cost function, so the marginal cost is linear. So, and, um, um, uh, and this equation is uh, nice, in my view, in the sense that it ties up discount rate completely, uh, only to the characteristics, to corporate policies, without any information from the pricing kernel. So in other words, you can develop asset pricing uh, completely from the supply side without any information from consumers. It's not like preferences are not important, they are important, it's just their effects are buried, in, already embedded in corporate policies. You can turn things around. So the way we teach finance courses in MBA classroom is that um, we teach capital budgeting in corporate finance class and when it comes to cost of capital, we tell students to go to investments class to run a cap and regression to get cost of capital. Uh, here we are turning things around, turning the table around in the sense that, hey, you can actually uh, infer about unobservable cost of capital from observable uh, corporate policies. And this equation, actually, if you take expectation on both sides, it says that expected return equals expected profitability divided by a marginal cost of investment. So it assumes that, well, it's, not, it's a result, not assumption. So uh, the, the, the big result is that in equilibrium, expected returns are cross-sectionally varying. So firms are gonna be earning different rates of returns going forward depending on profitability and the investment. Um, right, so I will have, uh, I'll come back to the intuition later on. I have a few slides on intuition, but for now let me, let me just uh, keep hitting uh, the big picture and then before, uh, and after that I'm gonna present the empirical applications. So in equilibrium, this is general equilibrium, so supply and demand, so consumption cap M and the investment cap M deliver identical expected returns, okay? Um, on the left hand side, and that's derived from consumption Euler equation, which is optimal demand, right? So from, from the, the second equality, that's from the supply optimality condition, it's from investment Euler equation. Supply and demand at the end of the day, they have to be equal, so from the consumption perspective, Consumption cap has been telling us covariances are the only things that matter for expected returns. In other words, covariances are sufficient statistics of expected returns. But uh, that's only, it's highly incomplete. I said pricing is not all about the pricing kernel. It's highly incomplete because it misses the supply side altogether. And in particular, if you look at the supply side, it says only characteristics matter. In equilibrium, they both matter, of course. So that's why I said the investment cap M is a supply theory of asset pricing. So there's an old joke in economics that uh, if you teach a parrot to say supply and demand, that parrot is an economist. I have three parrots at home and their names are um, Mango, Tilly, and Greeny. I've been teaching them to say supply and demand. That didn't work. So. At one point, I tried to teach them to say Q. That didn't work either. So, so this is Alfred Marshall uh, from uh, Principles of Economics. Uh, this so uh, very famous notion in economics, Marshall's scissors. So basically, you have supply and demand, and the intersection gives you the equilibrium price. But for a long time, and still, it's the case. In asset pricing, uh, most of us only talk about demand. This notion, well, asset pricing is all about pricing kernel comes from. So we're only looking at the demand and the supply, and only recently we've been looking at the supply. And I'm gonna argue that both supply and demand matter, and the supply is all gonna be more useful. Let me get to that point. Now let me say, both supply and demand matter for equilibrium prices. So history tends to rhyme, if not repeat itself. So um, I'm a, you know, avid, consumer of history of economic thoughts. So I like to think about, um, read about the uh, historical debates. Uh, it turns out that in the 1890s, there was a big debate uh, between the, uh, back then, the marginalists, uh, Jevons, Menger, and Wara. Uh, they argue uh, value, uh, this is microeconomic theory, value is basically what we call price right now. 
So they argue only marginal utility determines value. At the time, they were trying to uh, fight against the uh, establishment, uh, the older classical economists, uh, David R Ricardo, John Stuart Mill, they argue costs, only costs of production determine value. Okay? Uh, they use the water, so-called water versus diamond example. So why is diamond more expensive than water? Well, it's much more costly uh, for you to produce diamonds, and therefore diamond is more expensive, otherwise more uh, water is oftentimes freely available. Uh, but um, but the, the young folks back then pushed back and say, wait a second, suppose you are isolated, you survived the shipwreck, you are, you are, you are, you are uh, like in the movie Castaway, uh, you are in the middle of an isolated island in the middle of Atlantic Ocean. What do you want? Fresh water or diamonds? Of course, in that case, you're going to uh, prefer water. Water is going to cost you more. Water is going to be more expensive because water sustains your life. All right. So the debate has been going back and forth uh, for many years, and then Alfred Marshall came along and, um, and argued, well, just calm down both sides. Actually, you both matter. So we might as well reasonably dispute whether the, it is the upper or under blade of a pair of scissors that cuts a piece of paper as whether value is governed by utility or the costs of production. It is true that when, when one blade is held still and the cutting is affected by moving the other, we may say with careless brevity that cutting is done by the second only, but the state is not, statement is not strictly accurate. So my point is that ever since Rubinstein 76, Lucas 78, and the breed in 79. So in S pricing, we're so accustomed to thinking that S pricing is all about the pricing kernel, but it's highly incomplete in the sense that it assumes dividends are fixed. We are holding the supply blade completely fixed. We are moving, um, uh, with the, we, are, we are changing the parameter uh, values, uh, parameter values, trying to figure out the risk premium. Uh, but uh, you can do the exact opposite uh, dichotomy way, that is you hold pricing kernel fixed. In, in, in this framework, in the investment, what I call investment campaign framework, pricing kernel is not even modeled, and you let the corporate policies floating around, and then you can back out the cost of capital. And the firm ma maximize the firm value as well, uh, but, uh, but we won't have time to talk about the implication for valuation uh, due to time constraint here. All right, now I'm going to argue that uh, because of aggre so-called aggregation problem, the investment cap -M is much more practical, much more empirically tractable than the consumption cap -M. And we all know that in a surprise, there are so many anomalies. There are anomalies vis-a-vis -vis the, consum the consumption cap -M. So I'm going to argue why I'm going to try to attempt to argue why the consumption cap -M. It's a blunt, blunt blade. It's an old paper by Alan Kerman. I think he's based in Europe, uh, Central University of Europe, I believe. So uh, 1992 Journal of Economic Perspective, a pretty well-known paper, but oftentimes uh, felt like it's being ignored. So uh, Alan at the time was responding to the uh, macroeconomics literature, uh, but, uh, but my sense is that in a surprising, his crit critique uh, bites even more. So he argues is that individual rationality does not imply collective rationality and vice versa. And group rationality does not imply individual rationality. The response of a representative consumer to a parameter change is not the same as the aggregate responses of individuals. In other words, you change one parameter and then let the, all the people in this room change their optimal demand of uh, given goods, for example, and then you, you, once we aggregate everybody up, that aggregate response doesn't look like anything as our individual choice. It is possible for the representative to exhibit preference orderings that are opposite to all the individuals, and the aggregate behavior of rational individuals might exhibit complicated dynamics and the imposing these dynamics on one individual can really lead to uh, unnatural characteristics of the individual. In other words, if we continue to assume representative agent and we observe all these anomalies in the data, we impose 
um, all these complicated dynamics on that uh, if we force a representative agent model to use, explain all these uh, puzzling uh, effects in the data and that, behavior, that representative agent is gonna look like crazy. And which does not correspond to any individual behavior. So all this is actually going back to a, a old theorem in general equilibrium theor uh, theory uh, discovered in the uh, 70s and early 80s, the, the so-called Sunshine and Tell de Bru theorem. Aggregate access demand function is not restricted by its standard rationality assumption on individual demands. In other words, all of us individually are pretty smart. We <laughs> make choices very carefully once you aggregate all, all our access demand function, that aggregate doesn't look like following any laws. But that doesn't mean the equilibrium theory is wrong. So this is what I say. The, again, so this critique um, from Alan uh, Kerman was aimed at the macroeconomics. So, but I'm gonna argue uh, in a surprising, oftentimes we still talk about consumption cap M as our dominating framework. I'm gonna argue because of aggregation, consumption cap M is a blunt blade. And that's why it fails all the time. That's why uh, in the empirical uh, literature on anomalies, we hardly, I haven't seen a whole lot of papers. Uh, periodically, uh, th those articles show up uh, at top finance journals, but, uh, uh, but I'm not aware of any uh, uh, Wall Street investment asset manager uh, uses um, the cons consumption cap M. And in particular, if you take aggregation seriously, it means that aggregate consumption growth is not even a factor. And the four, because the investment model is derived for individual firms, the investment cap M is a microeconomic model, it has no aggregation problem, and therefore it's more empirically track tractable. And, and it goes on to argue that uh, characteristic based factors are as fundamental as macro, like consumption growth factors, uh, because characteristic based factors are derived from the supply side. Uh, for a long time, and um, people are still arguing this way, like pharma French, three factors are basically ad hoc and empirical factors have no theoretical foundation. I think now we do. <laughs> All right, for the rest of the presentation, I'm gonna talk about the empirical applications of what I call the theoretical framework called the consumption cap M. I'm gonna uh, briefly uh, summarize our results from the Q factor paper in Ho Xi and Zhang 2015 at RFS, and then I'm gonna present some of our latest work, uh, what we call the Q5 model, um, as well as the, uh, some stress tests, factor models, uh, and the, in, in, depending on how much time I have towards the end, and then talk about individual factor regressions. Right, here's the Q factor model. Um, it's a basically a factor implementation of the, um, of the theoretical uh, two period model I put up earlier. Um, so, so that's the market. Uh, so in the, in the standard classic cap M, so access return is basically uh, the market factor only. And um, um, we are adding investment factor profitability factor measured as return on equity. And then in the factor construction, we are um, uh, controlling for size, uh, two by three by three sorts on size, investment, and ROE, because some of these premiums are stronger in small firms. And therefore, in the factor implementation, we put size factor from the triple sorts back in there. And we show that the Q factor model uh, in that paper, we show that Q factor model largely summarizes uh, the cross-section of average returns at the time we had uh, programmed about 80 anomaly variables and the 35 of them are significant. So we used the 35 sets of uh, testing decibels uh, to, 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 to test the factor models and we show that the Q factor model uh, captures a lot of the anomalies that uh, plague the pharma French three factor and the cohort four factor model which adds momentum factor to the three factor model. All right, let me get to the intuition. So why does investment forecast returns? So again, the intuition is corporate finance, capital budgeting. So I have a figure here. The horizontal axis is investment rate or investment to assets. 
the horizontal, sorry, the vertical axis is the discount rate, okay? So firms can have different productivity, investment, and different uh, cost of capital, okay? And the cost of capital are not, the cost of capital are not observable, but we do observe their investment policy. Go to CompuStack and uh, download the mm, relevant data items. So I'm gonna argue that the oils being equal, high investment firms are gonna have low cost of capital, okay? So oils being equal, I'll give you two firms, firm A and firm B. Their profitability levels look like roughly similar. Uh, let's say future expected growth uh, looks roughly similar as well, but the, for some reason, firm A is investing much faster than in firm B, and from the equation that showed up, I put up earlier, and as well as from our uh, capital budgeting class, and we know that the firm A must have a lower cost of capital. Therefore, given a uh, given level of uh, cash flow and the net present value is high, and then you go out and invest more. All right? So I'm going to argue the investment effect manifests itself as different anomalies in the literature, oftentimes presented in different strands, this, uh, very different strands of the literature. Uh, uh, in, in empirical finance. So first is uh, Jay Reader's classic work on equity, long-term underperformance following equity issues. SEO underperformances and equity, uh, IPOs. Uh, it turns out in the data when firms issue a lot of equity, these firms tend to underperform in the long run. Okay, in other words, they have a lower cost of capital. And if you look at the data, A, so equity issues tend to invest much faster than um, um, matching non-issues, non-issuers. Okay, that's uh, uh, net stock issues, the same way is basically equity issues minus repurchases. Okay, so this uh, classic work by Theo Vermeulen, uh, when firms buy back shares, these firms tend to um, outperform. Growth firms with uh, low book to market, Growth firms are here as well, as value firms up there. So basically, in the investment framework, a market book is basically a different uh, measure of uh, Tobin's Q. Tobin's Q and market book are highly positively correlated, and therefore, when, you're, when Q ratio is high, investment tends to be high. Now, I know in the corporate finance literature, the link between Q and the investment tends to be weak, but once you aggregate things to portfolio level, like 10 deciles, the relation is actually pretty strong. So in other words, growth firms earn lower rates of returns because they are high investment firms. Or else be equal, they have lower cost of capital. Whereas value firms up there, they don't invest a whole lot, you know, because they are more likely associated with higher cost of capital. All right, market leverage. Um, the leverage effect, the way the, the, our typical corporate finance textbook talks about the leverage effect usually holds equity asset Asset beta is constant, uh, but here assets are freely uh, adjustable because of investment. High market leverage, um, uh, let's see, low market leverage often times means that, um, that the market uh, equity is large, is high. That means they have more growth opportunities going forward and they have, they have a lower cost of capital. Okay, whereas high leverage have higher cost of capital. So this is a, a channel above and beyond the typical Modigliani, Milan Modigliani proposition two. Long-term prior returns, this is deep on the Thaler 85 paper, so is a, they're basically different measure of uh, value versus growth. Higher accruals, so I've been, uh, I first wrote about the accruals about 10 years ago, and, uh, and as I'm learning more and more about the accruals, accruals is quite complicated. <laughs> It links to past growth or current investment. It is part of the earnings, and in, the, in our Q5 paper I'm gonna show is also part of expected growth, okay? But on this figure we just say, you know, uh, accruals basically high working capital investment, like inventory build up, uh, account receivables build up, because the firm is growing fast and generate a lot of account receivables. Right, so working capital investment, composite issues is basically a different way of measuring uh, equity issues versus uh, 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 share repurchases. All right, so, so now the other channel is the, uh, I just explained the intuition, 
behind the negative relation between investment and the cost of capital. Now I'm going to uh, explain the intuition between profitability and the cost of capital. Again, I give you two firms, firm A and the firm B. They invest relatively at the same level, relative to their assets, investment to assets ratios are relatively similar, but firm A has much higher profitability, profitability than firm B. And then we can infer, again from our standard capital budgeting intuition, simplified two period, two period only, right? So firm A, this, despite high profitability, you don't invest a whole lot, that must be your cost of capital is high. It's, 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 it's economic logic. So in other words, high ROE relative to low investment means high discount rate, okay? Suppose discount rates were low, combined with high ROE, low discount, rate, discount rates must imply high net present values of new projects and then you have to invest more and therefore you are not holding investment constant. So discount rates must be high to offset high ROE. So, um, so I'm arguing that price, earnings, momentum winners, and um, this last financially distressed firms have a higher profitability, and therefore they ought to earn, earn higher expected returns. It turns out that at least in a factor regression uh, setting, the evidence does support such a statement. All right, so our <coughs> Q factor model has one uh, um, endorsement from Farm and French. So in their, night, to, uh, in their 2015 paper, they added uh, their own version of profitability and the investment factor into their original three-factor model to form uh, the five-factor model. And uh, recently, a few months ago, they published a paper at the uh, GFE, uh, they further add the UMD, the momentum factor into the five-factor model to form a six-factor model. All right, that's the timeline, let me skip that, so. Uh, probably only important to me and my co-authors. Um, let me, instead, let me report the evidence on factor spending tests. Uh, Jay Shenken uh, recently published two papers, one at the JF, one at RFS, talking about the, when you compare factor models, the only thing you need to look at is factor spending tests, all right? So what, what, what do these tests do uh, is that uh, you regress the key factors from one model against the other factor model and you look at the alpha. If the alpha remains significant, that means the first factor model is stronger than the factor model being controlled for. Huh? And then you reverse the order. You reverse the order and see whether factor premiums survive after the control. If the factor premiums from a factor model do survive, that means that factor model is stronger than the second factor model. Okay, otherwise, it's weaker. All right, so um, this is the evidence um, from a working paper that has been circulating for four years now and we are revising for a journal finally. Um, so factor, so the, the sample from January 67 to December 2016, and this is average return, our investment factor premium 41 basis points, our E factor premium 55 basis points, and these stats are uh, close to five. And if you regress our investment factor on the pharma fringe, Five factor model, we are left with 12 basis points. Six factor model, we are left with 11 basis points. Not that big, but it's significant. The reason is that even though Pharma French is using our exact investment measure, but we are using triple sort on size against the size, together with size and profitability. So our investment effect is stronger because we can show for profitability. Uh, for profitability, uh, but their model, uh, but their investment factor is not. They're only using two by three from size and investment. So our ROE factor is much stronger than their RMW, 55 basis points, on average 47 and 30. So even after you can show for UMD, for momentum, we're still left with 30 basis points. Now let's look at the, so, so this table means that the form of range five and six factor models cannot explain, cannot subsume the Q factor model, the key Q, uh, Q factors. Now we turn things around and now we are regressing the key factors from the five and six factor models on the Q factor. So RMW, CMA and UMD both earn significantly positive returns, but look at what they are left with after you can show just the original four four-factor Q model, one basis points, zero basis points, and 11 basis points for momentum, but he said 
is below 0 0.5, okay? In other words, so we are, we, we should probably soften the language. In the current draft, we are saying the Q factor model dominates. We're gonna say next draft, we're just gonna say subsume. The Q factor subsume RMW, CMA, and UMD in the six factor model, which in turn cannot subsume the Q factors. By the way, this table has been replicated by many people. Uh, Stembo and Yuan model, Stembo and Yuan, the mm, mispricing factor paper uh, reported uh, uh, some evidence uh, that is quite close. And I know Berillus and Schenken paper uh, has this evidence as well, although they chose not to report it. Now let me talk about the, the Q5 model, which is uh, 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 we finished um, a new draft uh, only two weeks ago. The Q5 model. So we, we didn't feel like, um, <laughs> we didn't feel that that evidence is strong enough. Uh, so we, we, we have to go out and do more work. Um, so we're trying to upgrade the Q factor model by, by, by using a new dimension of factor variation, so which we call the expected growth factor, EG, the expected growth factor. So we show that the Q5 model improves on the Q factor model substantially. Now going back to the theory, recall in the static investment framework, so there are only two terms floating around, profitability in the numerator and the denominator, we have marginal cost of investment, which is increasing function of investment. Now in the mult multiple uh, period, in a dynamic investment framework, because you know, at the end of the next period, we don't just have a big party and all we go, okay? We have to save for the future, and that saving from the firm's perspective, we have to invest to sustain long-term growth, and that term is right there, okay? So basically, you intu the intuition is analogous to the intuition behind the positive correlation between profitability and expected return. The intuition is that all else being equal, if the firm is expected to grow faster, is expected growth is bigger, the expected return is gonna be higher. The reason is that if, if my next term is bigger, the next period of investment is bigger, okay? That means, and that provides additional term for my marginal benefit of investment today, okay? And to, to reach equilibrium, the cost of capital has to be high to compensate for that. And that's exactly analogous to the high profitability, high ROE, high expected return relation. All right, so this is the so-called capital gain component, and is roughly, because this term involves um, unobservable parameter adjustment cost parameter A. So when, when, when writing up the Q factor model, we didn't feel uh, compelled to go there and because, um, well, I guess science progress uh, step by step. All right, so, and then, um, then the key issue is gonna be what, how, how are we gonna come up with a proxy for expected growth? And the many people before us have tried that and mostly find, uh, find it to be a difficult thing. So, um, uh, we're not saying we nailed it, and uh, if anything, and this is, uh, this, is, uh, this, is, uh, this is a bit the loose end of our work at this point. Um, so we forecast investment to asset changes, okay? Because at the firm level, uh, as firms' assets oftentimes uh, decrease, making investment uh, uh, negative. So, and we tie our hands from a priori conceptual arguments. So we use Tobinsky, we go to the corporate finance literature, so it's like, what are the standard variables people use to explain investment? Oftentimes people use uh, Tobinsky and the cash flow, and uh, um, given in this case, we're not, for, we're not um, correlating with the current investment because we do observe current investment, we're trying to forecast future changes, so we added the uh, um, change in return on equity from my prior work with Tony, we showed that the uh, um, uh, last past earnings momentum actually uh, linked with the um, uh, next period expected uh, investment growth. So here's a key table. Uh, it turns out the Q is not very useful, although it's significant, uh, but the science 
uh, this slightly negative, so in economic term, terms, it's not that important. It turns out the cash flow is very important, um, and the change of ROE is important as well. So uh, both in terms of economic, economic magnitudes and, um, and, um, and, uh, and uh, uh, statistical significance. The in-sample R-score is small, and keep in mind we are forecasting future changes. Okay, so it's probably for, uh, in line with what everybody else has been reporting over the years. But mo what's more important is the out of sample correlation. In other words, after we form each month, after we construct, oops, the expected uh, growth, and we correlate the expected growth with the subsequent realized growth. We calculate both the rank correlation and Pearson correlation. So. It's, I will say it's decent. <laughs> so 14 and 21 at the firm level. Uh, keep in mind, this is at the firm level correlation. So, all right, and then we went ahead and, uh, and used the expected growth as a sorting variable, and we did the two by three sorts on size and expected, uh, this is expected the one year ahead investment to asset changes. Um, so, um, so average return is 82 basis points. So, so I, should, I should come clean. So basically, the, the expected growth factor is basically a combination of the three instruments we used. So it turns out uh, the Q factor model leaves a lot on the table, 63 basis points. Okay. Um, token skill doesn't capture much. So the major component in our thing is, uh, is uh, cash flow. So we measure cash flow using operating cash flow, cash-based operating cash flow from a recent Ray Ball paper and co-authors at the GFE. So we are trying to incorporate some of the uh, latest findings uh, into the uh, Q framework and uh, later on we're gonna have a good economic uh, interpretation for why, for why um, operating cash flow is a better predictor. So Rayborn and Coatas uh, document cash-based, ca cash flow-based profitability uh, dominates, uh, dominates the earnings-based ROE profitability in forecast um, uh, returns. Uh, we are arguing, we try to add on to their work by arguing, well, it's because the cash flows better capture expected growth. Well, as earnings, because of all kinds of accounting conservatism, uh, building on Baruch Leff's work, uh, the earnings, you know, oftentimes managed badly and expense doesn't incorporate R&D, advertisement, intangible capital investments, and therefore is a poor measure for expected growth. Well, as cash flows uh, is more immune to that weakness. Right, so cash flow is the main component of our expected growth factor, and DROE contributes a little bit as well, but not by, but not by a whole lot. All right, stress testing factor models. All right, so that's our Q5 model, and then we went ahead and did the large-scale empirical horse race, and we have this paper um, replicating anomalies. Uh, uh, we circulated last year in which we uh, coded up uh, 452, 447 in the last draft. Uh, we just finished a new revision. We have 452 now. Uh, in our latest sample through December 2016, we have in total 158 significant high minus low decile uh, returns. We are using them as the um, playing field. I think uh, this is the largest among the papers uh, that I've seen so far. Uh, in constructing new factor models. Momentum value versus growth, investment profitability, intangibles, and trading frictions. So seven competing models. We have a Q, Q factor model and Q5 model. And uh, we have Pharma French five factor model, six factor model. There are alternative uh, six factor model with uh, RMWC, RMWC. So the RMW is their version of uh, profitability factor, which is earnings based. Uh, they also try to build on Ray Boss work and by using a cash-based uh, profitability measure as well. And Stanbon Yuan's mispricing factor, Berilus and Schenken six-factor model, uh, if you look really closely, they actually embed the Q-factor model. So the investment and the ROE factors are from the Q-factor model. Uh, so you have to uh, read between the lines. So 
uh, Shenkang has been saying, wow, the Q-factor model is uh, better than the five-factor model. So, but they added the um, SNS and Frazzini, a monthly form, the HML factor, as well as UMD. All right, let me quickly go through um, Our testing portfolios, I'm not gonna go through one by one due to time constraints. We have uh, 36 momentum anomalies. So earnings momentum, uh, price momentum, and industry momentum, residual momentum, industry leak lag effect, as well as more recently documented, the customer momentum, supplier industry customer momentum, 29 value versus growth variables, okay, book to market or classic. We also did the monthly source on quarterly available uh, value versus growth variables, uh, multiplier. Uh, well, investment, we have 28, including not only real investment, but also uh, equity issues, accruals, different versions of accruals, components of accruals, 35 profitability variables, um, different versions, 26 intangible variables, organizational capital, R&D to market, um, R&D to market, um, operating leverage, and uh, Heston and Satka seasonality anomalies. So they, they are, their seasonality variables are the best performer in our gigantic uh, replication exercise in the last paper, replicating anomalies. Uh, many famous anomalies fail to replicate, but not the uh, seasonality anomalies by Heston and Satka, and their work is just truly outstanding, and none of the factor models can do anything uh, to their work. Uh, to, to their effect. Trading frictions as well. All right, so here's what we have. Okay, let me quickly go through this and then I'll stop and take questions. So here are the key results. So the Q-factor model already compares reasonably well with the six-factor model. So the five-factor model performs poorly. Um, so let me just look at the six-factor model. So this is a, the first column reports magnitude of high minus low alphas, average absolute high minus low alphas. So we have 25 basis points, the six factor model is 28, the alternative version 25, we have lower number of uh, significant, this is uh, not a just, this is a single test, not adjusting for multiple tests as Cam Harvey and co-author wanted. So, and that is informal way and imposing T cutoff of three. So Regardless of what you do, the number, we always have a lower number of significant alphas. 46 versus 67, 55, 6, 17, and 33 and 21. Um, and the alpha, this is an average absolute alpha across all the test cells, and we are quite close, indistinguishable. Uh, but however, I should point out that we do have three more uh, Chia, Gibbons, Ross, and Schenken rejections uh, than the Five fact, uh, six fact model, uh, and much more than the um, alternative six fact model. Uh, but uh, we do over uh, outperform in terms of a fewer number of significant high, num high minus low anomalies. So that's the Q factor model. Now let's look at the, the second role is the Q5 model. Uh, we improve on the Q factor model substantially 1946, 417, and we only have 58 significant GIS tests. So the Q5 model. Uh, so far, it's the best we can come up with uh, in this uh, factor race. Um, different categories, uh, oh, I should, uh, I should highlight this result. In the value versus growth category, the five-factor model, the Pharma French five-factor model is the best performer, okay? So, uh, because they do not have momentum in there, and momentum tends to be negatively correlated with the value versus growth, and uh, adding momentum actually hurts their performance. Uh, but overall, uh, we, but overall the pharma French models outperform our models in the value versus growth. And, but uh, we, we do better uh, in pretty much all the other categories. Momentum, uh, investment, and we have, uh, investment we have zero, basically. Uh, we do pretty well, uh, pretty well. Overall, the Q5 model is the best performer. All right, so let me conclude. I have more slides, but I, I think I should leave time for questions. So let me just conclude here. The Q5 model is the best performing model overall. The Q factor model compares well with the six factor model and the Stanbaugh and Yuan model uh, with a lower number of high minus low alphas but a higher number of GIS rejections. 
the five-factor model and the Borelis and Schenker model perform poorly, I would say. Uh, one has the highest number of high minus low alphas, and the Borelis and Schenker model has the highest number of GIS rejections, 147 out of 158. So they pretty much have trouble um, in the vast majority of anomalies. Uh, the reason is that uh, they have a monthly formed high minus low factor, and that, in, that, that in, because the strong negative correlation between HMLM and the UMD, and that makes the UMD has a large, uh, large loading in a lot of the annually formed value versus growth deciles, and that deteriorates their performance substantially. Okay, I will stop here. I, I'm open for questions. Go ahead. So let me see, there's new technology I need to get used to. <coughs> so how do I, how do I? Okay, let me, let me, let me start from here. So, uh, all right, here's a question, can you see it? Right, okay. You gotta love technology, this is cool. This is awesome. <coughs> So, all right, uh, awesome question. Is there a role for intangible assets in the Q-factor model? Um, not in the Q-factor model, but the Q5 model makes a serious attempt at the, at the, at the intangibles. So the reason is that um, um, the Q-factor model, when we were doing the Q-factor model, we were facing all kinds of resistance. We had to tie our hands really tightly in the sense that we started out with the simplest variable possible, which is accounting earnings. So, but uh, after we put the model together, did the uh, 161 at the time, the last drop, and now 158, there are lots of uh, uh, failures that Q-factor model cannot explain, even though the Q-factor model compares well with other factor models. So we have 46 anomalies, and then we stare at these anomalies for like six months. So, hmm. So they're all related to growth. In a sense, they're all related to your question because intangibles are not uh, captured by accounting earnings. Uh, firms are uh, accounting conservatism, meaning that you cannot uh, capitalize intangible investment, advertisement, R&D, employee training, um, organizational capital. I mean, all these things take time to build, right? Um, so intangibles are not uh, well measured, but you can, in a sense, measure it from indirectly from, from, from cash flows. So that's our interpretation. That's how the Q5 model is motivated, is interpreted, why they expect, we're trying to capture future growth due to intangible data being missing on firm's balance sheet. So yeah, awesome question, so. Let me go back, whoops. Okay, what did I do? Are the pricing, Andre's question, are the pricing factors for the Q factor model available? Yes, just send me an email. <laughs> so we, uh, um, yeah, we probably should show more um, uh, self-confidence. Uh, we're just being extra careful. Uh, but uh, pretty much when, uh, whenever people send us an email, we always reply, uh, supply the data. Uh, the, I, know, I know the factors are available for download in um, obscure, website available for asset managers. <laughs> so we supply the data, but yes, uh, abs absolutely, just, just, send us, just send us the email. So we are, uh, we, uh, again, we face a lot of resistance. Uh, we feel like we are big on the docks uh, in the factor debate. Uh, that's, that statement is probably a bit uh, aggressive. Uh, we are on the ends in a sense. So. Um, so we are, we are trying to be more careful with our data. I mean, we are learning the rules of the game as we go along, actually. But we think uh, we think uh, we think we're going to prevail in the long run, and we are very patient. We work incredibly hard, and uh, uh, we learn from our mistakes. Uh, we will prevail. So I have no doubt about it. Yes, sir. Hi, Professor. I'm from University of Edinburgh Business School, and. From the Q theory, we know that the investment and the profitability are determinants of the cost action as price. But you add the SI factor into the Q4 factor model. According to my knowledge, I, the SI, it seems like the size factor cannot accommodate to the theory, Q theory. So how to explain the size factor in the Q factor model? 
And my another question is about uh, factor models. So since Pharma French, the factor models in 1993, uh, three factor and the most cited paper so far. And 25 years passed and there are so many factor models. And last year, the Stumble, and they have four, fa four factor missing pricing factors. And this year, the Daniel, Kent Daniel, David Hershelev, they have two behavior factors and they don't add the size factor. Mm. So my point is, when the factor models will end up and the war between the factor model will end up and does this mean the factor model give the highest sharp ratio, the tangency portfolio, which means we need to find the, the maximum, the highest sharp ratio, or it is like, uh, Pharma addressed in his Nobel speech that is two pillar of asset pricing. One is the efficient market hypothesis and another is the factor model, the asset pricing models. If we find any anomalies that cannot be digested by factor models, it, it is not the market is not efficient, but actually the market is, is efficient. The thing is the factor model that doesn't work, so we need to find better factor models. So the 25 years past, Asset pricing progress is so slow, and <laughs> yes, and I just want to know because I'm start my new academic career and the, I'm in a startup stage, and I want to contribute some new asset pricing picture. And do you have any suggestion? Many thanks. Um, the second question is too big. Uh, I'm going to start with the first question, which is more specific. So why is the size factor in our lineup? Um, uh, we use the size factor, I agree with you from our two period model and size factor is not exa exactly motivated, uh, but uh, in, the, in, the, in the broader theoretical framework, uh, size factor is motivated. So uh, basically to, to, to write down the equation analytically, the two period model, and we assumed um, constant return to constant returns to scale. Uh, in other words, the investment rate does not depend on the scale of your productive assets. So you know, it's, not it's not exactly market equity, uh, but it's, not, it's your physical size. Uh, but, uh, but in my thesis in 2005, a journal finance paper, so I had decreasing return to scale. Um, and there, uh, we do have, I do have the size effect. So in fact, um, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in my one of, uh, I think it's just one, sorry. Uh, in my forthcoming uh, journal, uh, in my forthcoming GFE paper, so uh, my co-authors and I reported some simulation evidence. So actually value premium is stronger in small firms. And this is an insight that apparently we have not done uh, too much try to communicate, uh, disseminate uh, more broadly in the profession because yeah, our, uh, our energy has been on factors. So in other words, Schleifer and Vishen limits to arbitrage explanation is not the only one for anomalies being stronger in small firms. So in the investment framework, we have that too, okay? Uh, the intuition is that because of decreasing return to scale, small firms, you're gonna have more dispersions. So a little bit difference in productivity, you're gonna drive a lot of uh, uh, dispersion in all kinds of characteristics, including risk and expected return and investment among small firms, and that's why you see a bigger magnitude of anomalies in small firms. Uh, your second question uh, uh, is, is much broader. Uh, let's see. Uh, you ask me to forecast uh, the future path of the literature. It's, it's tremendously hard, and uh, I can forecast what my co-authors and I will be working on. <laughs> Uh, within a short window of two years. Uh, three years out is all, is all anybody's guess. It depends on, so research is so much fun in the sense that it's interactive and, uh, and uh, our optimal decision depends on our uh, professional colleagues and oftentimes rivals. Uh, they oftentimes have a conflict of interest and we are learning the rules of the game as we go along, but it's good. Uh, they, uh, competition is good, they make us better and they make, uh, they make us more serious and more careful and more, uh, I dare say, more creative researchers and, and, and we work on important questions. Uh, so um, so I, I, the thing is, I don't know what the outcome's gonna be, so. 
Um, well, I, I know we will be, we will, we will, we'll keep working hard and keep pushing our line of work because we fully committed. We full be, 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 because we believe uh, the message we communicate is unique, is new, and it can push the, it can develop the scientific discipline, and that's what we believe in. And, uh, and of course, we remain open-minded to uh, dissenting voices. We try to learn from them, but uh, but who knows what's gonna, yes. what their surprise is going to be. Yes, but I'm. I'm very concerned with the factor models because I survey a study of the factor models, and I know the more recent years the paper come out, the highest sharp ratio it gives. So if I create some factors, I I know SAS, MATLAB, and this kind of software can use the machine readable data, yeah. machine readable data from CISP, and yeah. it's very easy to, for for someone to find a good factor and yeah. cannot be explained, yeah, and absolutely. then you use this factor as another factor model. Right. So so far. I've seen, the, you know, this year, GFE and Pharma French, they have their six factors. <laughs> and it's made, I'm, I'm a fan of Cochrane because Cochrane emphasized the factor models are good relative pricing for cross section returns, but right. they don't give the economic intuition. Right. I know the consumption cap M or cap M doesn't work for the cross section. And right. Yeah, but the thing is, I really want to know whether there should be a change for factor models because data mining, data snooping, and this is criticized for other no. areas. And no, that's fine. So um, yes. um, I, uh, your point is well taken. So uh, a lot of factor models are largely data-driven, um, pure, almost largely statistical, empirical in nature, uh, starting from the, th the pharma French three-factor model. And in our work, we try to tie our factors to to first principles. And I think our work is unique in this debate. It's becoming bigger and bigger. And you mentioned Rob's work with uh, Yuan, and you mentioned uh, uh, Hirschleifer, uh, Daniel Hirschleifer on some paper. So I think, uh, I think, um, I think our work um, uh, is more tied it with economic theory. And that said, uh, let me uh, issue a caveat. Uh, so for you theorists out there, uh, um, so my, my recent GFE paper does show that uh, that the value pre that the, the value factor uh, is can be generated within a dynamic asset pricing model uh, through simulations, uh, but the theoretical literature has not re developed to a point that we can generate the value and the momentum together in a coherent framework. I haven't seen that. Maybe 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 people have done it, but no, I don't think so. So Ching Li's paper is the closest that come to my mind. Um, that, uh, that, that the management science, um, but his paper, is, his model is partial equilibrium model, ideally, so you want to have general equilibrium model, and my recent work does get to uh, general equilibrium, and we do show that the consumption cap and fails, even with the pricing kernel framework, <laughs> in a general equilibrium in which consumption is endogenous, uh, because of a lot of the model nonlinearity. Um, Data mining, yeah, it's a um, it's an issue. We try to do our part, uh, but uh, but uh, I agree with you. Uh, faced with the uh, uh, competitive pressure, so we have to think about uh, we have to make some choices. Um, so um, so yeah, I mean I mean uh, Rob has been very very nice and very fair to me over the years. So but that didn't stop us from taking a shot at his uh, mispricing factor in our recent working paper on motivating factors. Basically, uh, stand by Yuan. Uh, fact the mispricing factor, they argue their factor model does better than the Q-factor model, N not quite, uh, because they changed uh, factor construction. They were not using NYSC breakpoints and 30, 40, uh, and 30, 40, 30 cutoff. They were doing 20, 60, and, and 20. Once you reconstruct, which we did, once you replicate their factors using the standard factor construction, and their factor model becomes uh, much weaker, in fact, the correlations between their mispricing factors and the Q factors are over 80% 80, 80 <laughs> so basically we are rediscovering the Q factors in my view but I'm biased of course and same goes for the DHS model Daniel Hirschleifer and some model and um, um, uh, um, they, they also changed the uh, rules of the game by uh, by making the factor construction uh, more extreme any other question Apparently, no. Oh, sorry. Hi. 
Thank you. Uh, I'm Huang Maowang from University of Kent, UK. I have uh, three questions about the asset price literature. And in the Pharma French, there are five factor paper. They mentioned the, one of the problem that the, the five factor model cannot explain is the portfolios of uh, firms with a small size, but the investor a lot, and uh, the profitability is uh, small. They, mm. In their paper, they say they have issues to explain this portfolio. So how do your Q-factor model explain this? Uh, uh, let's mm. see. Uh, um, they have issue explaining small, the low profitability firms? Yes, yeah, small, small firms right. invest a lot, right. but the profit profitability is low. The profit is low. Oh, OK. Uh, uh, we have not looked at the um, double-sorted uh, testing portfolios. So we have, in a sense, <laughs> Uh, you know, we and uh, our rivals have reached a gentleman's agreement that we stick with the univariate uh, testing deciles and they do multiple uh, size sorted testing portfolios. This way we don't, we avoid uh, uh, stepping uh, on each other's toes, I guess. So, um, so one thing I do know is that our ROE factor is much stronger than their RMW factor. So although they are also using uh, ROE, but our ROE is monthly sorted on quarterly earnings. Okay, uh, it's much more powerful. Uh, that's why from the factor spending tests I showed you earlier, and um, um, yeah, in the, in our 2015 RFS paper, we we reported the size and the book to market portfolios. Uh, we did do pretty well, including the small growth portfolio that they were having problem with. Uh, but I should say that uh, if memory serves me right, by the way, I don't really trust my memory. Oftentimes I would forget uh, which floor of the garage I parked in my car. So once I entered the elevator, three, four, and five, I would just take turns. Right, if memory serves me right, uh, our model has a bigger, small value alpha in the two-way source. So. Uh, my second question is about this. Uh, Another branch of literature that discussed the uh, financial leverage, they explain the asset pricing, the, the asset returns. Mm. So uh, do you have any comparison between your Q factor model with this uh, financial leverage model, the financial intermediary based asset pricing model? Oh, right, right, financial intermediary. Um, uh, I don't really believe that, so um, sorry, I don't want to sound too negative. So uh, we actually, we looked at uh, that uh, financial intermediary beta. So in our paper, Replicating Anomalies, uh, that we are revising for a top journal. So we replicated the um, financial, the broker dealer leverage beta in HN, Atula, and Mu paper. So uh, actually they reported the same evidence in their paper. Um, if you just sort using rolling regressions of returns on broker-dealer leverage and look at the beta, and that beta is not priced in the cross-section. In a sense, it's not surprising to us who've been working in the field for so long because your rolling betas are measured with a lot of noise. So you use it the second time around in farmer Macbeth regressions, the slopes are gonna be uh, very close to zero. So their main conclusion, which in my view is that strong, so the, in the abstract they say that our single factor, single, the word single is in emphasis, the single factor explains uh, value and the momentum as well as the latest multi-factor model. But that conclusion is based on uh, regressing broker dealer leverage on six size and book to market portfolios and the momentum as basis assets, okay? They use the fitted component as their leverage factor. See what I mean? In a sense, it's not directly financial uh, intermediary leverage factor they are using. They are using size, book to market, and momentum portfolios to explain size, value, and the momentum portfolios. Uh, of course, the right-hand side is repackaged a little bit. They were fixing the slope coefficients. So, but, um, but my general view is that these covariance-based uh, uh, factors are not nearly as strong as you t if you just construct factors on, 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 on firm level variables. Third question. Okay, the last question is, uh, uh, there's uh, another direction in the literature is the integration of uh, macroeconomics models to asset pricing. 
I, I read one of your paper about the disaster-based model asset pricing. Yeah. So can you give some comments on this uh, direction of the asset pricing? Yeah, sure. Um, uh, Amir Yerong uh, is my advisor at Wharton. So when I was in school, every time I, I made this point, I'll get Amir uh, up to arms. So I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I, I guess I've made somewhat uh, commitment to the disaster literature. In my view, long-run risk is uh, it's really hard to measure. You have, at the end of the day, string theory. We live in 11 dimensions. Believe it. Okay. So, but disaster, we can actually see some data. Um, so, I mean, my interest in the disaster line of work, and I recently, you know, uh, lucky me, I put the two papers accepted uh, in top journals. So uh, the reason I invest uh, quite a bit of time de developing that uh, pretty hard to penetrate literature is that uh, in production-based, that's surprising. A lot of work is partial equilibrium in nature because we don't know how to close the loop for the equity premium puzzle yet. <laughs> we just don't. I think my GFE paper makes, uh, the forthcoming GFE makes some progress because once you assume exogenous disasters in a production economy, uh, like what the barrel, recent barrel, did in the endowment economy, we actually come close. Okay, although that's not the main point they emphasized in that paper, and uh, and Erica, Erica Lee and Han Bai and I we are thinking about developing the further and with the sole emphasis on the equity premium. So in other words, in the endowment economy, we have Campbell Cochrane model, uh, Benzo Yaron model, and the Reed's barrel model. But well, as in the production economy, the field is wide open. Uh, we, we do not have a benchmark model that reached a consensus level, or at least one of the strong contenders. So I'm heading there. Well, I also invested some time in the labor market search literature. So uh, it's pretty cool uh, in the sense that uh, once we solve the model carefully using globally nonlinear algorithm, we actually see some of the big disasters. Uh, that we actually matched to Barrow and the Wusua 2008 uh, data set. That was, that was unexpected ex and neither one of us was expecting to see that result. As we call that paper, we titled that paper Endogenous Disasters. So we're not, uh, uh, it's not, again, not that surprising yet. Uh, we are trying, we're struggling to solve the model using capital endogenously, but we're making some progress. So Hanbai and I, we, are, we, are, we, we have some results just uh, in our computer. <laughs> Uh, but uh, it's, 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 it's nice in the sense that uh, you can finally close the deal after, uh, after so many years, but the progress is slow. Thank you. Any other question? Thank you. now with the uh, the certification of our students and uh, you step up to the podium once you hear your name all right Juanita can I have the uh, certificate
Excuse me, the reception is outside uh, where the lunch was held. It will start in uh, about 10 minutes. So just outside of, the <coughs> of this room, uh, there will be a reception uh, in the garden. Thank you. <laughs> 